we're back in the saddle again with Parker McDonald. All right, that may sound weird to some of you, but Parker is a saddle hunting fool chasing whitetails in the south, and he's accessing some amazing spots on public land via kayak. Today, Parker is going to break down the best kayak for the job, how to stay safe on the water, how to keep your gear safe, and we're going to take a quick look at his saddle hunting setup. We'll link to all of Parker's gear in the show notes, and remember, if you buy anything through those links, Gearbox Talk is, is going to make a commission, and we will donate 1% of our proceeds to an outdoor nonprofit that actually teaches kids how to hunt, so we're and future generations into this lifestyle, which I feel like is really important. I think you would probably feel like it's really important. So if you're going to buy the gear anyways, do it and support the show, but most importantly, support an outdoor nonprofit doing fantastic work. If you're into gear talks and specifically whitetail, subscribe to this show. I mean, I'm a whitetail fanatic myself I, and, and at Gearbox Talk, I am using this to talk to all kinds of other whitetail fanatics. We've already had a bunch on the show and I'll link to those at the end. Stick around to see who, who I'll recommend if this is your first Gearbox Talk episode. But I also want to mention if if you have questions that you feel like are dumb and you're new to whitetail hunting or you're trying to learn, first of all, I'll assure you your questions are not dumb. Everyone starts somewhere. But second, if you don't want to ask them in the comments here or something, you don't want people to know you're the one asking them, go on Go Wild and send them to me. Find me, Brad Luttrell on Go Wild, and I will gladly find an expert and we'll talk all about your question. We'll find someone who knows exactly that answer. Or if I've already talked to somebody about that, I'll send you the show. You know, go ahead and let me know what you're thinking, how I can help you get better. All right, that's enough chatter. Let's let's dive into accessing public land via kayak. This is Gearbox Talk with Parker McDonald. McDonald, one of our first repeat guests here on Gearbox Talk. I'm excited to get you back, man, because that saddle hunting episode we did went gangbusters, and we promised we would get you back on here to talk about your kayak setup, which is what we're doing today. How's it going, dude? Dude, it's going well, man. I uh, just just left your neck of the woods like a couple days ago. Yeah. Um, just getting home and uh, unloading all of my gear and editing video and you know stuff like that. So it's going good. I can't complain. Yeah, and make sure you're following along with Parker to be able to see what he's been up to uh, up here in Kentucky. And we'll probably – are you coming back to Kentucky at all this year? Oh, yeah. I paid way too much for that Kentucky tag to to uh, not kill a deer in Kentucky. So, <laughs> um, spoiler alert, I don't kill a deer on early season Kentucky trip, but I'm definitely coming back for the rut. Good, man. Good, man. I I, uh, I can't wait to see what you're able to accomplish up here in the rut up here in November. Uh, all right, man, let's dive in. I want to we're going to talk about kayak hunting today. And, you know, first, if if there are any fundamentals we should cover, I want to hit that up front because I don't like diving in straight into gear. If there's some things to keep in mind that we can educate people on, because there's a lot of a lot of things that are more important than just the gear itself. So what sure. what are the fundamental things to keep in mind when considering kayak hunting? Yeah, so there's there's a couple of things. Um, I am bad about I'm bad about say like uh, I'm gonna be a father. I'm a I'm a dad, and I'm gonna be that type of father. It's like do as I say, not as I do, um, <laughs> because I'm bad about you know a lot of this stuff when it comes to kayak hunting, especially per like pertaining to safety stuff. So uh, I actually just recently wrote an article, and I'll read a couple. There's like five things I think on here. Um, and the number one thing is safety above everything else. So the thing that people have to understand is when you're going out on the water in a boat early in the morning into places where if you're doing it right, there should not be anybody around. Um, you, you have to depend on yourself. Like there, if you fall in the water, nobody's going to be there to help you. It's four o'clock in the morning. Nobody's going to be there. You know, you're out in the middle of nowhere. There's not going to be just a random bass fisherman at four o'clock in the morning that's going to be able to hear you scream. Um, so safety is the biggest thing. And uh, there's a couple ways that you can, you know, maintain that safety. And number one is to wear a life jacket. And this is where I have uh, fallen into the do as I say, not as I do. Um, I have uh, in the past, I keep a life jacket on board. I always have. Um, but every single time I go out, I'm like, man, what if this is the time that I just like hit a rock or, 
or, you know, a gust of wind like surprises me or, or whatever, you know, and I, and I go overboard and I just can't, I don't like that idea, especially when you, when you think about hunting boots, if you're wearing rubber boots, heavy clothes, like if you fall in the water and that stuff gets water in yeah. it, you're, you're done for. Yeah. And so, um, one of the greatest things that I've seen is the, uh, um, Onyx, uh, PFDs, basically the, the, um, CO2 activated ones where you, you know, when it hits the water or whatever, it inflates, mm -hmm. it doesn't, it doesn't, um, require a whole lot of bulk on you. So, um, that's been the biggest thing for me is when I'm going in, you know, a big heavy life jacket is almost more unsafe than not yeah. wearing one, you know, right. cause you, you have to have, be able to move. And, um, anyway, so that's number one thing. Um, number two thing is to always, you know, be able to have, ha always have somebody that knows where you're going. Right. Um, technology is huge right now. Um, you can pretty much do anything. You can share your location with your wife, with your friends, with your parents, some family member, somebody to know like, Hey, if, if I don't text you at this time, then that means that something's, something's wrong or I've shot a deer or something like that. You know, I mean, but always have that person that you're communicating with. My wife has my location and my dad has my location. Um, and my dad's actually hunted with me in most of the places that I go into. So if something bad were to happen, he would be able to guide somebody to help. That's um, really great advice just in general. That's not just kayak, you know, uh, hunting any, anytime you're on public land and somebody might not know the spot you're going to. It's great advice. Yeah, it is. I would advise not to give it to your friends. Um, don't give your location to your best friends because if ever there is a time when you and your friends have a falling out and now all of a sudden they have all your hunting locations. So, um, there's always that, uh, make sure it's somebody who doesn't care about hunting. Yeah. Um, pick your vegan friends. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's the number one thing is safety. You always want to think about safety. Um, especially when you talk about getting on the water in the cold weather. Um, number two is have a success plan. Um, and I have three bullet points right here. So if you are using a, um, a heavy duty kayak, you know, it may just be as easy to just throw a deer on top of the kayak and go. Um, but most people are not, most people are using the cheap Walmart sun dolphin kayaks or something like that. And that's great. Like whatever it takes to get you out there. Um, but have a success plan. If you were to kill a deer, what are you going to do next? You know, so there's three different ways you can do it. You can pack it out. Um, just quarter it up right there in the field, um, put it in, in, uh, game bags and put it in, in your boat somewhere. I mean, that significantly decreases yeah. the, uh, the weight of the animal. Um, the number two thing is you could tow a raft. So, um, I actually had this idea before any of the ideas that I ever had was like, okay, if I'm successful, how am I going to get this deer out? At the time, I didn't know if my kayak would actually do it with the kayak that I had. And so I was like, well, I could just take an inflatable raft and put it in the hole somewhere, um, pack it away with a pump or something like that. And if I kill something, just inflate it up and throw it in the raft and tow it behind. So that's the number two option. Um, always, always a good, you know, th that would work. I promised you it would mm -hmm. work. Um, third is a life jacket method. So I, I would not personally try this, but people have done it and done it well. A guy named, uh, uh, Shane Simpson, who is uh, big in the Turkey world. He's actually done this with a deer where he just threw a, a life jacket over, uh, like put it on the deer. Like it was a human. I mean, yeah, it makes sense. They're built to haul 300 pounds and deer's yeah. not going to weigh that. So, yeah. So, I mean, the water resistance might be a problem as you're trying to paddle. <laughs> that's, that's my, that's my worry is I'm like, I ain't trying to, I ain't trying to drag a deer through water. Yeah, that would just Yeah. Be even though it's floating, that's dead weight, man. Yeah. So, um, important thing with that is, um, not to gut the deer. Don't gut the deer before you do that. Mm. Um, because if you do that cavity will fill up with water and it's just going to make it even heavier. So, um, yeah. And also it'll, it'll get there and get inside the meat and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. From the meat that. perspective, I definitely wouldn't do that. Yep. And so the, the last thing is just throw it on top of the boat and go, which is what I've done every time. Um, super easy if you have a kayak that has a weight capacity and also has enough space um 
to put an animal, it's super easy to do it, man. And that's what I've done every single time. I love, like, for me, the reason why I do it is I'll, I'll drag a deer a long ways just to be able to experience the paddle out because mm-hmm. it's just fun. Like, it's just, it's just so much fun. Yeah, to, for sure. Like, be paddling and see that deer laying in front of you, and it's just cool. Um, all right, so the number three thing, number three uh, thing that I would do is carry lots of leashes. So um, you are carrying in a lot of gear. You've got a backpack, you've got a, a stand if you're using a stand or, um, you know, I, I don't do that anymore. So I use the saddle. Um, and so I'm wearing that. So I don't have to have a leash for that. But you've got a, a gun or a bow. You've got all kinds of stuff that you're carrying in there with you that if you were to flip the boat or if you were to just hit a big, you know, log or something and God forbid something fall out, uh, you could be in you could be in bad sorts right there. I've actually been there with my dad. He uh, he flipped his boat. We didn't have any leashes. He lost his gun into the bottom of the lake. Um, his bag fell in. His He was using a climber at that time. Uh, his climber fell in. Luckily, we were able to retrieve everything except for the gun, uh, but we eventually got that um, with an anchor. It was pretty cool. We fished it out of the bottom of the lake. That was pretty sweet. Um, I've been but, there, too. My first time, I used to kayak and canoe a ton, and my first time out on the boat, my wife and I uh, hit in a, in a bend of a stream, hit a log that was submerged. And as soon as you get sideways on a stream, you're screwed. And so the kayak took on water and I watched all my stuff go downstream. And we spent the next 45 minutes, well, after I got the boat uh, out of the four foot deep uh, turn that we were in, you know, <laughs> once I got it on the bank and, and emptied out the water, I had to fish out everything out of the stream that I could find. My wife, I also learned that we, that we were very new to this at the time. Uh, we also learned the hard way that you don't kayak and flip flops because <laughs> we never saw her shoes again. <laughs> no, nope. I mean, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. There's yeah. a lot of variables that can go wrong in this. Um, so it's just best to be prepared for the worst. You know, I, and I'll throw in people get overconfident thinking that they're good swimmers. But here's the thing. If you flip, you don't know what your head's going to hit. And you're not wearing a helmet when you're kayaking, um, especially in the hunting scenario. And, you know, if your head hits a a log or something, you get knocked out, you're done. That's it. So, you know, super important to even if you don't, you know, even if you feel really comfortable because nobody's out or the water's, you know, glass. um, If if you were to hit something or I mean, you never know, dude, freak accident, something could come out of the water and scare you and you flip the boat yourself, you know, and if if you hit a rock or a log and you you hit your head, you're done. That's it. Dude, in Kentucky, uh, where I hunt in Kentucky, there's a bunch of Asian carp on this river. Yeah. And and those things, dude, they make me so nervous at early in the morning. I will not go like all out, you know, because yeah, I'm like, you'd be waiting feeling, on one of those Asian carp to come and slap me in the face. Filling you know? a boat with a protein you didn't anticipate. Exactly. <laughs> um, so in terms of leashes, you can buy like yak gear or whatever um, brand of leashes, or you could just buy a bunch of paracord and cheap carabiners and yeah, keep all that stuff. Keep it in your boat. That way, if you are to ever flip over, everything will be still attached to the boat. Um, number four thing is walk before you paddle. So um, I try to walk every area that I'm going to hunt. I try to go and walk it before I hunt it and or before I paddle to it. That doesn't mean if I'm doing it right, I'm going to be in areas where you cannot walk to. But I want to go to the closest possible access point of this particular parcel of, of public land and make sure that you cannot walk to it. Because if you can, I've been in a lot of situations where I've wasted a lot of time and come to find out I was 50 yards away from a parking area um, because I didn't go and check it out. There's some, if you're using Onyx or whatever, there's sometimes there's a, a gravel road or a trail that you can't see that doesn't yeah. show up and it leads right to the piece of property that you're planning on hunting. Um, and that's just, it's just part of it. So I'm going to go and I'm going to basically drive the perimeter of that whole chunk and make sure there's no access. Most of the time, if it doesn't show up on Onyx, then then I am right. But there are times where it has been. Pre- there was a time last year where I dude, I I went like four miles down the river, and I was like, I get up there and I walk up to a spot, and there's tire tracks and 
a parking area and i was like what the heck man yeah you spent all this effort to get to something somebody can walk to yeah yeah not, i i could have got there in two minutes yeah. you know and <laughs> but hey it was um, fun <laughs> yeah yeah i learned a lot so so that's um that's kind of the four basic things um that i would say i think that's it is there one more oh yeah there's one more and that's uh being aggressive um when you're hunting with a kayak you have to understand that most people are not coming at deer from the water deer need water to survive they use water for an advantage for a lot of different reasons um bedding being one of those they'll bed close to water because they know that danger doesn't come from that from that direction normally so you have the ability to be aggressive when you're coming at it from a boat or kayak or whatever if you're coming from water access you have the ability to be a little bit more aggressive than somebody walking in so don't be afraid to go into an area that might be really, really close on top of a bedding area or a feeding area because most of the time the deer, in my experience, I've been doing this for several, several years now, and in my even now, in my experience, when I see it, when I pull up, you know, in the morning and my headlight, my headlamp hits a deer's eyes right on the bank, they're not scared. Mm-hmm. Like, they'll just kind of walk off and be like, yeah, whatever they're used to seeing fishermen out there, man. Yeah. Like, right. They're used to the activity on the water. And, uh, and so it really gives you the ability to be aggressive. What are the, are, um, didn't plan on this question, but it's one I see debated a lot. What are the state laws or I, every state's going to vary, but in general, what are the laws around shooting from the boat? Give, give people a, a, cause I see discussions around this and y- you know, you, you've done this more than anybody I know. So what, what can you share about the legality of shooting from the water? Yeah. Every state is different. Um, I can speak for Alabama and I want to say maybe Tennessee. Um, but I know for sure in Alabama. So, um, and a lot of states are going to be very similar. So you, I actually shot a Turkey from my kayak last year, last season. And, uh, I use a motor on my kayak as a 2.5 horsepower motor, which is pretty sweet. Um, I haven't always had that, but it's, it's, I learned nice little upgrade. That, yeah, I needed that little upgrade. I'm trying to be more effective and, uh, I'm not trying to make it look harder. I'm trying to be more effective, you know? Right. And so, um, the laws are actually that you can shoot from a watercraft as long as it's not in motion right? So you can't be like in a forward motion. Mm -hmm. And if it has a motor, it cannot be running. Mm. Okay. So that's, that's like the, that's like the, the Alabama laws. Let's just say Um, the ultimate advice is to check out your laws, mm -hmm. but just in general, that, that kind of squashes some of the, you know, the discussion I've seen of like, can you even do it? I've seen a lot of people having arguments of this and, and the ethics of it even, and I don't have a stance on that. I was just kind of curious of what, what you thought. Yeah. So, I mean, and most people, a lot of people, not most people, a lot of people misunderstand what I'm doing when I use a kayak. I'm using a kayak to access landlocked yep. pieces and waterlocked pieces of property. I'm not trying to hunt out of my kayak. Right. Like I'm, I'm getting out and I'm going and hunting on these pieces of property. Um, the situation with the turkey was just a freak situation. Yeah. You know, it, right. it, it literally that was the only way that it, it, that I could see that that could have ever happened. Um, but people hunt from, people hunt ducks from a kayak all the time. Yeah. Um, I think Alaska has some laws against it now, but, but, you know, totally different. I've never hunted in Alaska. I've been to Alaska, but I've never hunted there, but, um, I'm pretty sure like black bears, for example, I don't think you can, you can hunt from the water. Um, it's, I think it's considered like an unfair advantage because they spend a lot of their time, uh, and it's, you know, you can access it. I might be wrong on that. Somebody might comment and tell me I'm wrong, but I, I feel like I actually saw that in an episode of meat eater. So I, I, uh, they had some episodes where they were chasing black bears uh, from kayaks. And I think I recall that either way, I'm not saying it's true or not. You should look it up yourself, but the ultimate answer is to, to find out what your state permits. Hey man, I'm going to move us along to, um, another safety question. You mentioned tethering your weapon, but uh, do you have anything, is there a special case or anything you put your gun or bow in? Because, I mean, obviously, if it goes over like that gun, you know, you don't want your gear to get waterlogged. Uh, are yeah. you doing anything special or are you just being really careful with it while it's tethered? So I keep, uh, my first year, that's what I did. I just, like, threw it in the boat and went. Um, now I use actually, so I use a new canoe Frontier 12 kayak. And new canoe sells 
a uh, it's basically think about like an ATV gun rack, um, like the two little forked things that okay. come up like that. Um, New Canoe sells one specifically for their boat, and that's what I use for my gun and my bow. Uh, before I had this this kayak, I was using a Perception Striker. And it's basically just like a big giant barge of a kayak. And I actually mounted some some of those same ATV yep. racks off of Amazon from uh, I think they were made by Colpin. And I just mounted those to the side of my boat and put my gun and my bow into there. Um, I you know that that probably doesn't answer your question as far as keeping it dry or anything. Well, like no, I that. guess the question is, do you worry about that, or is it kind of you know part of the cost of doing business? It's, co- it's the cost of it, man. Like, I don't have enough. I probably do have enough space for a, a, a bow case or a gun case, but I just, it, I don't want to have to deal with that whenever I get to my spot in the morning of taking everything out of the case. And because usually where I'm, where I'm paddling to or, or getting to is going to be right close to where I'm hunting. I'm not yeah. typically. You don't want to be going through a bunch of stuff. You know, there's yeah. a big uh, with, with how popular this has gotten, there's a big market opportunity for somebody to make an easy access dry bag for b- guns and bows. Like yeah. a quick, you know, I mean, those dry bags have gotten to be really cool. Um, they, they're made out of like the raft material or like a lot of the soft yetis are made out of that kind of stuff. It'd be cool to see a, a quick access bow case for kayaking. Um, all right. So I think we covered your, your, um, you, you actually mentioned your kayak and mm-hmm. you, you we've talked about transporting and the safety side of things. What we're going to do now is Parker's actually going to show us firsthand his setup. So we're going to cut to a different clip of him. He's going to actually show us how this looks, talk through his setup, uh, maybe not everything in place, but it'll give you at least the ability to visualize this for this particular show. This isn't something we always do, but I, I felt like, uh, you know, it'd be better if Parker kind of walked us through with his gear and, and gave us an actual visual. It's kind of hard to talk through a, ca- uh, a kayak on camera as we're doing right now with a zoom call without giving you guys total motion sickness. So we're going to cut to a clip of that and Parker will give us a breakdown. What's up everybody? In this video, I wanted to give you guys a more in-depth look at my new canoe F12 and how I set it up for deer hunting. Some of the things that I think are super important when it comes to trying to hunt deer from a kayak. Y'all check it out. The new canoe F12 is a 77 pound kayak. It's 41 inches wide, 12 foot long, and it has a 650 pound weight capacity, making it perfect for deer hunting. I'm attaching my bow or my rifle to my new canoe by using these shotgun mounts that new canoe makes specifically for the F12. They go perfectly into the gear tracks and I'm attaching it with a leash that I made just out of paracord and a carabiner. One lesson that I learned the hard way was to always have a tie off rope. Tie off to something. If it's a rock, a tree, whatever, you don't want the water to rise and leave you stranded somewhere like has happened to me before. Super easy to do. It's a cheap thing to do that can save you a lot of time. One of my favorite parts about the new canoe F12 is that it has a square transom in the back so it can hold an outboard motor. I'm using this Yamaha 2.5 and it has been awesome. It gets me about 8 miles per hour. It's got a forward and a neutral. I've created this little piece made out of a monopod basically that telescopes so I can adjust my forward and neutral and my kill switch straight from my seat. All it is is just a telescoping camera monopod that I put a little L bracket on with zip ties. Super easy to make and super cheap. Another item that you can get from the New Canoe website is this U-joint tiller extension. It's perfect. It balances out the weight because you need to sit forward if you're going to be using an outboard motor. You can adjust your direction pretty easily. This crate in the back serves a double purpose. It holds all my gear as well as a way to mount my safety light for paddling in the dark. Occasionally, you're going to have situations where you have to pull start your boat from inside the boat. I made this little paracord as an extension, so I don't have to reach all the way back there to do it. And lastly, I try to make sure I have everything valuable attached to the boat, like this little leash that I made for my outboard motor. Overall, the new canoe F12 has served its purpose extremely well for me. I really like the fact that I can easily carry out a deer. I can carry all my gear out at the same time. There's tons of space. The weight capacity is huge, and it has a lot of customizable options to fit pretty much anybody's needs from the fisherman to the duck hunter to the deer hunter, and I love it. All right, Parker, thank you for showing us your gear set up on the boat, man. I, I'm, I'm really excited to get that out there. That, that's, a, that's something that I think people are going to be really interested in. But also an important part of, the, of kayak or canoe hunting 
is getting in there lightweight and you are really passionate about your saddle setup. And I'll go ahead and say that we have a really thorough breakdown of Parker's saddle setup, but just, I wanted to do this again uh, on a high level. We won't get into the weeds as much as we did on the other episode, but let's, let's start really quickly with your, you know, talking through your, the, the saddle brand you use, what you like about it. Yeah. So I use the, the tethered phantom saddle. Now I started out, uh, with tethered on with the tethered mantis saddle. Um, and I'll tell you, man, like there's just, there's not a lot, um, it, saddle is such a simple thing that is also very complex like when people look at it they're like oh look a loincloth like that's <laughs> but it's yeah. it is it is actually a lot more complex than that so this is the tethered phantom saddle and i've got all my stuff attached to it right now um these are my my pouches that have all my ropes and my uh uh i think my um gear hook that goes around the tree where i hang everything from um, very important if somebody wants to get into saddle hunting, these are awesome, especially if you're not filming, you could literally fit everything you need into two pouches and that's all you have to go in with. And tethered makes, um, a platform as well. So there's the platform. It's the, uh, predator platform. And they, uh, the, there's a company that I use. It's, uh, it's called Genesis 3d printing and he made these little 3d printed nice. books yeah. like that. And it's really freaking tight, man, because the uh, the Predator actually fits in there perfectly and, like, locks into place. Oh, nice. So, so all you have to do is – there it goes. All you have to do is, like, just buy a, a hook, a platform, a saddle. Like, you could literally carry everything you need just right here. Um, but my favorite things about the Phantom saddle, you've got the comfort channels right there which allow you to, um, I don't know if you can see that, they're like yep. notched right there. And this is your bridge, so your bridge comes in front of you like this. That's what actually is hanging um, and supporting your weight. And what this does is it pulls the pressure on different parts of the saddle. So if you put it underneath right here, it's going to pull more pressure by your legs for a sitting position, like, like a chair. If you move these up top it's going to pull pressure from the top of the saddle Essentially basically sh shortening the distance so that you're more upright yep exactly exactly and uh and everybody's different everybody has a different body type different body shape that's the the good thing about the the phantom saddle is it's it is so easy especially for somebody who's new to saddle hunting it's so easy for them to get started with with this because it's so adjustable um another thing is this adjustable bridge so that's the bridge i was talking about um all my stuff is muddy right now from being <laughs> in it, kentucky because you put it to work man yeah so you can see that that bridge is longer right there and i can shorten it up like that and make it shorter just depending on what the person likes and that's the best part about it is you can buy a phantom saddle and you can just go and adjust it to your liking. There's so many adjustment points. I couldn't even possibly get to all of it. You know, it's yeah. it's awesome. It's a you great know, saddle. When when saddle hunting started getting popular over the last couple of years, I think a lot of people thought, um, and the, the initial reaction was like, oh, the Westie culture is hitting whitetail and people are trying to be more mobile and make it really hard for themselves and fit. And there, there was a little bit of a perception of that at first. But now I, I think it's becoming more under like there's a lot of benefits to it. I had Dan Johnson come on and he's not necessarily hunting the same setup you are, but he talked about the importance of mobile hunting. And and the first season he did that when he was truly mobile and didn't rely on a, a single tree, how many more deer he saw. I think he said he saw more deer in that one season than he probably had in all of his years hunting. And and what you're doing is, is the same mindset as what Dan talked about. It's a great Gearbox Talk episode for anybody listening. But I think, you know, mentally, I think there's a barrier for people that might be built a little bigger for for saddle hunting how comfortable are these things like if you're a big guy is uh, whether tall or, or or big is is this something that is going to intimidate you or do you think it's just as good or safe as a, as a regular tree stand oh man i, I don't think that there's i don't think that there's going to be an issue for just about anybody i mean there's there are people who are extremely large <laughs> you know that are maybe maybe consider it does take 
a little bit of athletic ability. I'm not saying you have to be like a crazy good athlete, but you need to be, you need to have some type of athletic ability, just about as much as it would take to climb a climber. I start to say, you I know. don't, I've got people that I know that are big and they use a climber. Yeah. And I, to me, like a, a climber is not that much different than what you're doing from the athletic side. And, and I think it's almost like, it's not even almost athletic. It's like being, the ability to be, um, nimble is, is almost more exactly. of what it is, you know, a climber, um, you know, that's, that's a lot of work too. And I don't really mm -hmm. see what you're doing that much harder than, than the climber. I think it's a better system than most climbers. Uh, and I, I just, I wanted to, to get your opinion on that. Cause I do think that's a barrier for people. It feels like something that wouldn't be fit for their body type. Well, m most people, the most athletic part about the whole thing is climbing, right? It's your climbing method, What there's, there's, a million different climbing methods but the the basis is like if you can climb a ladder then you can saddle hunt yeah that's it i mean if you can if you can use climbing sticks which is essentially a ladder that you strap to the tree if you can use those things then you can you can hunt from a saddle the saddle yeah. the saddle itself is there's nothing that requires you have to get your body in a saddle shape that's a real thing like the the saddle is going to you know, pull your body in different, different ways. You're going to have more pressure on different parts of your body, but after a couple of weeks of hunting season, you'll be, you'll be golden. The most athletic part is climbing your climbing method. And there's some of those methods that are like, you better be daggum in shape to try it. But there's also some that, I mean, it really, if you can climb a ladder, you could climb a tree to saddle hunt. It's just yeah. not that it's not that hard. People really, really like to um, make it seem like it's like super hardcore and like, oh, I'm a saddle hunter. And I'm people say that saddle hunters are the crossfitters of the hunting industry. Yeah. Um, and because if like if you meet somebody who's a saddle hunter, you'll know they're a saddle hunter by the first 10 minutes of your conversation. Because they'll tell you. <laughs> yep, they'll, they'll make sure to tell you. But it's really not that hardcore, man. It's just effective. Yeah. Like, it's fun. It's a whole lot more fun. It's effective. Um, it's lightweight. Dude, it's just, to me, it's a no-brainer. Everybody tries to say, like, well, everything has its, it's just another, you know, tool in the toolbox. And I'm like, no, not really. I mean, I've sold out to it, man. I I, I won't ever, I'm not going to say never, but I I will never buy another climber Right. for me, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, between, sure. between you and Dan, I, I've got some deciding to do because I, I have a bunch of uh, fixed stands on the property that I hunt and I got a multitude of them for options. But then I have a, a climber that is, I don't even use it like a mobile climber. It's more like it's, I'm almost using it as another stand area because it sits on the tree that's the best yeah. for it in that area. But after talking to you guys over the last couple of shows, I'm like, man, I got to go to one of these methods. I don't know which one it's going to be. And you know, I, I, um, Dan's really just using a bigger platform is kind of at the end of the day, like the difference between the, the platform he's using and what you're using. I mean, there, there are some nuances, I guess, but, um, you know, yeah, Dan, Dan, I've talked to Dan a lot and, uh, um, Dan's, Dan's a, f a funny guy. Cause Dan like really does mobile hunt like yeah. a lot, but he just doesn't want to, uh, he just doesn't want to follow the crowd. Dan's a <laughs> Dan is definitely a uh, his a, a one man wolf pack. Like he doesn't want to just do what everybody else is yeah. doing. He's gonna sit back. I love Dan. He's awesome. I'm actually uh, just recorded for his podcast last a couple days ago. Yeah. Um. And he, he makes fun of me for being a saddle hunter and all that yeah. stuff. But, well, anybody else, we give them a hard time, but Dan's also pretty effective at killing whitetail. So I guess I guess a very we, good job. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I got to say, check out Parker's first episode on Gearbox Talk. Check out Dan's if you're in if you're really trying to learn about, um, you know, mobile hunting. I think both of these guys give some great advice. Parker, I thank you for coming on, man. How do people find you? You create great content. You want I've, I've told you this and it's not flatter. You're one of my favorite content creators out there. Where can people find you and where can people find your content? Yeah, you can find uh, Southern Ground Hunting on YouTube. Also, you can find us on the Sportsman's Nation Podcast Network, um, which is owned by this this Dan that we have spoken of. <laughs> uh, he owns the Sportsman's Nation, and I'm a part of that group as well. So uh, you can find the podcast there. You can find the YouTube channel um, just by searching Southern Ground Hunting on YouTube, and you'll find it there. 
Yep. And Parker's got a multitude of great videos. You can really start to get a feel for his setup when you check those out. We'll link to all those in the show notes. We'll link to all of the gear that Parker talked about in the show notes. Parker, man, thanks for coming back on and, and doing a little bit of explanation around kayak hunting. This has been great. Yeah, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on again. Yep. Take care. Yes, sir. You too. Thank you, Parker. I love this dude. Um, just a quick reminder, all the gear that he talked about is going to be linked to in the show notes. And if you're into this to uh, this topic, check out my first show of Parker, which is really long. We do like a thorough dive into his whole saddle hunting setup. And I also want to call out a recent show I did. You know, we mentioned Dan Johnson, but also check out my show of Bo Martonic. Bo's going to talk about calling whitetails on public land. So it's very related to what Parker just talked about. If you're really into gearbox talk, then just subscribe. You know, whether you're on YouTube or, you know, hit that little bell, uh, subscribe and the bell to get show notifications. Or if you're on a podcast, go ahead and subscribe per your platform. These are great educational topics, and it, it would be a shame to miss out on, on what we're talking about here. I'm going to continue to have Whitetail guys on, and I invite you to subscribe so you don't miss out on those conversations. Drop some comments in the show notes, or when you go on to Go Wild, you can log time for this show, which is cool. Boost your score, which helps you reach more people. So if you hit plus on Go Wild, hit outdoor uh, log time, outdoor podcast you'll see gearbox talk right there you can hit what show you listen to and then you can at mention to tag me and let me know uh, what questions you have or what you thought about the show or who you'd like to see on next we've already seen a couple shows where people said hey i'd like to hear from this person and i went out and i got that person that's what we do at gearbox talk i'm here to help you guys and if you don't let me know i'm just gonna go find people that i want to talk to so contribute to gearbox talk it's, it's your show just like go wilds your app i'm doing all this to help the group help the community so i'd love to know what you're thinking and who you want me to talk to all right. I think that's it for today. I'm out.